Now, this is, this, they call this a breakout session. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> Every breakout session I've ever been to at G3 had about, you know, 30, 40 people in it, and there's more than 30, 40 people here. So I'm having to sort of um, rearrange my thinking as to how to uh, handle this. Uh, this is not a sermon by any stretch of the imagination, and it's not even like the lecture where I'm going to do tomorrow, where we're going to be talking about manuscripts and stuff like that. Uh, Josh got smart and let the preachers do the preaching, and he's got the professor doing the professor things, and so that's probably best for, for everybody. Um, but one thing that I wanted to do, and so we'll sort of have to, I'm not, when am I supposed to get done? That's always a dangerous question to ask. <laughs> when am I supposed to be done, actually, is, uh, is, is the question. No one knows? Good. <laughs> if no one's going to answer the question, we got plenty we can cover. <laughs> Let the spirit lead. No, no, no. <laughs> you, were, you were looking it up. Nobody knows? Four? Four? I've got, I've got 90 minutes? Okay. All right, so I'll probably get done a little bit early so that those of you who want to can come down. I, I cannot pass this around the room, okay? Uh, but I have with me, some of you know what this is. My, I'm sorry? No, it is a 1550 Stephanus Greek text. It was printed in 1550, so it is just under 500 years old. And so if you want to see, this was the last Greek text printed without verse numbers. So the man who printed this, Robert Estian, called Stephanus, he was Calvin's printer in Geneva. Um, between laying this out and printing, it's a beautifully printed text, uh, and the next year, he went through and all of those verse divisions that you have used to memorize scripture your entire life, you now know where they came from. They came from Robert Estian in 1550, 1551. And so if you've ever thought, you know, I, I, I don't know why the verse broke here. I mean, I, you know, this doesn't make any sense. You can blame him. <laughs> uh, I actually think he did a pretty decent job, honestly. Um, but uh, this is a genuine 1550 Greek text, and so if you'd like to see what, the, what it looked like in comparison to a Greek text today, and to be absolutely amazed at the fact that the paper that they made back then is so much better than the paper we use today. <laughs> My seminary textbooks have yellow pages. My seminary textbooks look older than this, and it's from 1550. Uh, so I'll have this down front, uh, but please uh, do not uh, spill a Coca-Cola on it or anything like that, uh, because that would be very, very bad. So anyway, what I want to do, and I see, see in a, I'm not sure how they're doing this or if they're, because this is just a breakout session. I tend to be very peripatetic when I, when I uh, teach. And in fact, uh, I'll be teaching early church history at Grace Bible Theological Seminary two weekends from now. And what I like to do is, once I get going, I like to walk behind the students to see who's playing Minesweeper. Um, <laughs> and then sometimes I'll jump in and play along with if it's really a boring part of the lecture. But um, I like to walk around. I like to be, to, to be moving. And in a breakout session, I would normally be sort of doing more interacting than we're going to be able to do, uh, given the fact that this is the, the whole spiel uh, in, one, in one place. So... Uh, what I want to do, since we're talking about Scripture, one of the greatest concerns I have had for decades now is the fact that many Christians, we love our Bibles, we cherish our Bibles, we carry them with us. Some of you are more electronically oriented, and so you have your, your Bible on your phone or your iPad or something along those lines. Uh, most of us want to have a really nice leather Bible and things like that. Just sort of, there's just something about that feel in the hand, things like that. But where did it come from? I remember, I was raised in a Christian family, and my dad went to Moody Bible Institute. He studied under Kenneth Weiss there in the 1950s. 
And so I did have a good background uh, in, in things like that. But still, I remember as a teenager hearing the pastor of the church we were attending say something about, in, in the Greek it says, and I remember thinking to myself, why should we care what the Greeks think anyways? I don't understand. <laughs> what's, what's that all about? Because to me, the Bible had always, well, looked a little bit like this. Um, this is my brand new, no one steal this, please. This is my brand new Legacy Standard Bible, rebound by Jeffrey Rice. Yes, it is made of goat skin. Oh. And you're, it's, you're still not getting it, it's not up for sale. Um, and I just assumed when I had a Bible that this is how the Bible had always existed that it was always had, had gilded pages and it, it had the certain order of books and, and uh, you know, there was a table of contents in the front. So if you, you just, no matter how hard you tried, you couldn't find Zechariah, you could at least look up the page numbers and, and get there eventually and stuff like that. That's sort of how we imbibed where the Bible came from. And then I started witnessing to Mormons. And that was in high school. And very, very quickly, I had to start learning about the real history of where the Bible came from. If you own a Bible today, you are in a tiny percentage of Christians from the beginning. Tiny percentage to actually own a copy of the Scriptures. Can you, for, you have no idea how many centuries of Christians would have given almost anything to have the access you have to the scriptures. I mean, think about it. For most of the history of the church, if you wanted to have your own copy of the scriptures, you know how you got it? You hand copied it. You hand copied it. Well, but wait a minute. Most of them weren't literate. Right, which meant they didn't get to have it. And even if you were literate, some of the major manuscripts we have, for example, of the Bible from like the third and fourth centuries, we've estimated that they would have cost nine to ten thousand dollars just in the writing materials alone for a single copy of the scriptures. And yet most of us, how many Bibles do we have? Good grief. Not enough. I've lost I have lost track of the number of Bibles that I have owned through my life, some of which I've given away. I still have the first two Bibles that my parents ever gave to me. Um, and so we, we have such great access. But how often have we ever thanked God? I thank you, God, that I live in a day when I have full access to the whole counsel of God and Scripture. But what does it mean that many of the great theological battles of the past were fought when most of the people in the quote-unquote pew did not have access to the scriptures outside of hearing them being read in the church service itself. Now, yes, there would be readers. Um, in, uh, when I, I, like I said, I'm going to be teaching early church history, and one of the stories that I like to tell is of these two sub-deacons that in May of 303 were arrested by the Roman Empire. If you're not familiar with the fact, the Roman Empire, starting in 303 through 313, that was the most intense period of persecution against the Christian church. Ten years, right there at the end, they tried to wipe out Christianity. All Christians, didn't matter whether you were in leadership or whatever, uh, you had to offer sacrifice or die. And these two sub-deacons had been arrested. And they came before the magistrate, and the magistrate wanted them to turn over the scriptures. And they said, well, they're, they, they're just sub-deacons. The readers have the scriptures. Well, who are the readers? Well, we're not going to tell you. We're not going to be traitors. Here we are. Kill us. And so they did. And so here are two subdeacons. We don't know anything about them. They were probably married. They probably had children. And they were executed for not giving over the names of the people that possessed the manuscripts of the Bible. They probably didn't even possess a copy for themselves. And it, you and I... How often have we ever thanked God that we have? We, we literally have what we have because of the shed blood 
of those who've gone before us. And there were many of them. We just happened to know these two. There were many, 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 many more that we will only learn about in that great day of judgment. And so it's easy for us as Christians to think that everyone's always had the kind of access that we have. Not only that, but I would imagine that probably in this room, there's minimally a dozen different translations in English represented. And some of you might have translations in other languages represented because English may not be your mother tongue. And so we have all this availability to us of the, of the word of God today. But again, the English language didn't exist when the Bible was written. And so there has to have been a process of transmission over time. And this is exactly where unbelievers attack us in the world today. We send our young people into universities, and I'll be honest with you, in the vast majority of situations, we send them in unarmed, unprepared. Because the one subject that we as Christians should be very familiar with and very trained on is how we got our Bible. If we're telling people this is the word of God, if we're telling people I am going to base my entire life on the words of this book, then you would think we would know significantly more about its history than anything else's history. And yet most of us know a whole lot more about certain television series and movies than we do about the history of the book that we claim to be the very word of God. And that's where the enemy attacks. That's where people like Bart Ehrman come along and they show you where certain manuscripts didn't contain this and certain manuscripts didn't contain that. And we are left going, wow, I didn't know. Well, yes, you did. Open your Bible and look down at the bottom of the page. Okay, it might be in the center column if you have the center column reference. But in the vast majority of Bibles, down there in the bottom, now at my age, it just looks like the smudges at the bottom of the page. Um, but for you young, eagle-eyed people, uh, that stuff down there at the bottom that says, some manuscripts say this and some manuscripts say that, let me, give, let me clue you in on a little something. The vast majority of pastors are hoping you're not noticing that either because they really don't want you coming up to them and asking them about why it is that the verse they just got done preaching on isn't found in some of the earliest manuscripts. Because when you go through seminary, yeah, if you want to take those classes, if you want to read those books, you can, but the reality is there's not a lot of emphasis put upon it unless that's your, your specific area of study. And so there's a, there's a discomfort and even when preaching, even when preaching, many a, a minister will, will just stick to the one translation they use and, and it, it can cause problems. Uh, I remember once one of our volunteers contacted me and she said, you know, my, 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 my preacher spent an, an entire sermon preaching on a verse that I couldn't find in my Bible. I sort of ruined the, ruined the, the sermon for them, I can assure you of that because it was a, a major textual variant and they didn't realize that there would be a bunch of people sitting in front of them that had a Bible that did not actually contain the verse that they themselves were reading from. And so there is a history to our text. And you see, we like to think that, well, you know, the Bible's just sort of been photocopied down through history. It doesn't work that way. The photocopier was invented in 1949. The Bible was written before 1949. <laughs> And that means it had to be hand copied from the time of the original writing. And I'm talking primarily New Testament here. When you start talking about Moses, we are talking old here, okay? We are talking ancient here. And the only way to transmit those things over time is from one person to copy what another person has written. Now, under the Old Covenant... The Jewish people had a certain way of doing those types of things, and it was primarily transmitted within the community of Israel. And as you know, about 900 years after the time of Christ, the Masoretes rose, and they, they had amazing mechanisms of, 
of making for extremely accurate copying of their texts. So we have the Isaiah scroll, for example, as you know from the Dead Sea Scrolls, that is pretty much absolutely identical to the Masoretic text that we have today. And in fact, for many, many years, the, the uh, oldest manuscript we had of the book of Isaiah came from around the year 900. And then they found the Dead Sea Scrolls, and they found the Isaiah scroll, which is from about 100 years before Christ. So 1,000 year leap, and they're, they're basically identical. So you don't have to have corruption or change over time. Be very careful, by the way. Be very, very careful. That is a true statement, what I just said. The Isaiah scroll, I, pretty much identical. Jeremiah is different. The Jeremiah scroll and the Dead Sea Scrolls is very different from, for example, the Greek translation. It's about a third different. Why? Because if you read Jeremiah, if you read the story of Jeremiah, what does he himself say? At one point, the king had his scroll ripped up and torn up and he had to rewrite it and so on and so forth. So there were multiple versions of Jeremiah in his own day. So that makes sense. You need to recognize that. But then did you all hear about what happened just about two and a half years ago? There was a scroll that they had found, but it was fossilized. So if you tried to unroll it, it would just turn into powder, just like that. And so some geek, uh, thank God for geeks and nerds. <laughs> geeks and nerds unite. Some of you are going, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> some of you just put your phone down from watching Stargate SG-1. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm watching the, you right now. I can see you. Right? <laughs> I can, my, my far vision is pretty good. Don't worry about it. Um, we have some geeks and nerds out there who went, you know, the, the, the ink that they used had a, had a different makeup than, than, of course, the papyri, and it had certain metals in it and stuff like that. So if we x-rayed this thing and then fed it into a computer, and that's what they do. They x-ray it. And then they feed it into a computer, and they can literally unroll the scroll in the computer and read the text. Guess what it turned out to be? The Jerusalem Times. No, no, it wasn't. <laughs> what was worse, it was the classified section of the Jerusalem Times. So completely irrelevant now. One donkey for sale. Very mean. That's a, uh, they discovered that it was Leviticus and it is identical with the Masoretic text of Leviticus from a thousand years later. I'm hoping they find some more cool stuff like that personally. <laughs> but that's the Old Testament scriptures. And just to, I'm going to throw this out at you and it may make you uncomfortable, but just write this down and think about it. There were different translations and versions available in the days of Jesus. So, for example, in Psalm 22, when it says, they pierced my hands and my feet, some Hebrew texts, that's what it says. Other Hebrew texts say, as a lion, rather than pierced my hands and my feet. Those are not quite the same thing. There were differences in some of the manuscripts in the first century. And not only that, but what was the Bible that was normally quoted by the early writers? The Greek Septuagint, the Greek translation. That makes sense. When Paul's writing to the church at Colossae, the vast majority of the people going to be reading what he's writing, read Greek. What version of the Old Testament scriptures is going to be available to them? The Greek Septuagint. Did the Greek Septuagint have differences from the Hebrew? Sure did. In fact, I'll just throw this out here and let you think about it. But in Hebrews chapter 8, when Jeremiah 31 is quoted about the new covenant, there's a key phrase. And in, if you go back to your Old Testament, most English Bibles are trans translated from the Hebrew primarily. And so if you read Jeremiah 31, there's going to be a section that says, though I was a husband to them. But then you read it in Hebrews chapter 8, it doesn't say, though I was a husband to them. It says, though I did not care for them. 
Those are not quite the same things, are they? They're a little bit different. Now, by the way, that's the difference in Hebrew between ba'al and ga'al and bet and gimel look a lot alike, so it's a one-letter difference, but it still has an impact on the meaning of the text. And the writers of the New Testament were willing to quote from the Greek Septuagint even to make a point. So dealing with multiple translations is not something new. It existed in the first century. If you have any other questions, especially about that particular text, ask Steve Lawson. Now, <laughs> woke you up, didn't I, brother? <laughs> He's sitting there going, what did he just say? <laughs> what? What am I supposed to know about? Okay. Anyway, these, these Britney Spears microphones. <laughs> so, how did you get your Bible? How did it get to you? Now, we're going to be looking, at, like I said, tomorrow we're going to be looking at manuscripts. We're going to be looking at papyri and unsealed manuscripts and minuscule manuscripts. All sorts of really fun stuff. And you're like going, okay, when's he speaking? Because I'm not going to be here for that one. <laughs> But honestly, it's fascinating. When you look down at the bottom of the page and it says some manuscripts say, haven't you ever stopped and gone, I wonder what those manuscripts are? I wonder where they are. I wonder what, th what they look like. I wonder, I wonder who wrote them. Well, we're going to talk about that tomorrow. So uh, tomorrow morning, I think 11, 15-ish, something like that is when I'm supposed to be doing that. But you have a handwritten manuscript tradition. And even though the Romans tried to destroy all of them, they don't get to all of them, thankfully. And so we have manuscripts that have been copied and copied down through the ages. And when you get to the period of right, right before the Reformation, uh, you have something really important that happens in world history. And that is the, the collapse and the, the, the defeat of the city of Constantinople, modern-day Istanbul. The Muslims are moving west, and Constantinople finally gives in in the middle of the 15th century. And so many of its scholars leave Constantinople, they flee into Europe, and they bring their manuscripts with them. This is extremely important. They're Greek manuscripts. What's the Bible in Europe at this time? Well, from early on, the West adopted Latin. As its, trans, as its language, and hence the Latin Vulgate was the official Bible of the church in Europe and had been for 1,100 years. Nobody knew anything else. And so here come these Greek manuscripts from Constantinople and Greek-speaking scholars from Constantinople right at the time of the Renaissance, and right at the time of people, uh, the, the, the saying was ad fontes, to the sources, to the sources, go to the sources. And they knew that the Bible had not been written in Latin. And so the official church position was, this is the official text. But the scholars were recognizing, well, okay, it may be the official text, but that's not what it was originally written. It was originally written in Greek and Hebrew and some chapters of what's called Aramaic. And so... <clears throat> Just so we can keep, the, keep the speed going here, there's a guy you need to know by the name of Desiderius Erasmus. Desiderius Erasmus was a Dutch humanist scholar. Humanist did not mean back then what it means today. He simply believed that we should study the original sources and that we should use our minds to the glory of God. He was a Roman Catholic, as everybody was at that particular point in time, pretty much there in Europe. He was actually a priest. But he questioned much of what Rome taught on certain issues. He got himself into a lot of trouble for that. In other places, he agreed. He even wrote a book in defense of, of transubstantiation in the Mass. And he's the same Erasmus that wrote the first written debate with Luther of the Reformation on the bondage or freedom of the will. But he was extremely important to the Reformation beginning. Why? Because he recognized the need for a printed edition of the Greek New Testament, not just the Greek New Testament. At first, to be honest with you, when he put out his first edition, um, he was primarily focused upon his own new Latin translation, which was dangerous. 
This man was risking being burned at the stake. He really was. When he put out his first edition with the Latin on one side, the Greek on the other, the grave danger for him was the Latin because he was challenging the official text of the church. But there was also danger in putting the Greek there because the Greek was the language of the heretics. And so he put it there, but he didn't put a lot of work into it. He moved to Basel, Switzerland to finish the work. He hoped to find more manuscripts there. He didn't. He only had no more than about 12 manuscripts to work with. And the oldest was a thousand years after Christ, and he didn't trust that one. So most of the manuscripts he was using were from 12 to 1400 years after Christ. And so his Greek New Testament was of varying qualities. And when he got to the book of Revelation, he had a real problem. Because of all the books of the New Testament, the book that we have the fewest copies of is the book of Revelation. And the reason for that is it struggled for inclusion in the canon of Scripture. There were a lot of people that were like, yeah, I don't think so. I mean, think about it. Um, do you really want the early church going, we don't have nearly enough books with ten-headed monsters and seven-headed seven beasts coming out of the sea. Like, we need some more of these, you know? No, they, they were like, did John really write this? What does this really mean? What's the connection to the apostles? And so there weren't all that many manuscripts of uh, the book of Revelation in Greek, to be obtained. In fact, all he could find was a Latin commentary that had the Greek text embedded in it. And he had to extract the Greek text out of the Latin commentary. And he made lots of, made lots of mistakes in, along the way. I'll be perfectly honest with you. Erasmus had very little respect for the book of Revelation. He really didn't think it was scripture. He really didn't think that it, it, it deserved the place that it had in the New Testament canon. And so he's rushing. It's the last book he did. His printer is putting lots of pressure on him to get, the, uh, get this done because his printer knew, and we think Erasmus knew, that someone had already printed and published a Greek New Testament in multiple volumes. It's called the Complutensian Polyglot. Very nicely done. But here's the problem. Back in those days... It's not like you can go on Amazon and self-publish your own book today. Hey, I've got a published book. Yeah, great, wonderful. wonderful. It sold four copies, and they all went to my family. Um, <laughs> that's not how things worked back then. If you wanted to publish a book, you had to get papal approval. You want to talk about red tape? There's red tape. And so even though the work was done, the volumes were sitting in crates in a storehouse. And so Erasmus's printer knew this and said, if we want to get ours out, you've got to get this thing done, dude. And so he gets to the book of Revelation. He's rushing. He makes various mistakes. And then he gets to the end of the book and discovers that the commentary he's borrowed, the last pages have fallen off. He doesn't have the last portion of Revelation chapter 22. What am I going to do? And so what he does, and he admits it, is he takes his own Latin translation and translates from Latin into Greek. And that's what he puts in. Now in the process, Greek words that had never appeared in any manuscript of the book of Revelation ever are placed upon the page. But he had to get it done. And like I said, he didn't really view the book of Revelation as being as authoritative as the rest of the New Testament. And so that's what he did. Now, he knew that was not the way to do it. But they go ahead and publish it. comes out. It's wildly received because it's small. It's easy enough to, to carry and to be distributed and things like that. And you might be going, well, wait a minute. What about the red tape? Ah, they took a risk. So what Erasmus did to try to get past the papal red tape, he dedicated the book to the Pope. <laughs> <laughs> so he dedicated the book to the Pope, didn't get himself turned into a flaming fire, and that's how he got it out first. 
Now, let me tell you a fascinating little story that I only learned a couple years ago. Because I've known about the ending of Revelation um, in, in Erasmus's work for a long time. And I knew that the words that he inserted there and the readings he inserted there at the end of the book of Revelation are in the printed editions of what's called the Textus Receptus and hence are in the King James Version and the New King James Version of the Bible to this day. And I'm like, um, he did five editions. He had plenty of years between 1560 and 1535 to have fixed Revelation. So why didn't he? And why didn't anybody else catch it? Well, this is the fascinating part and also illustrates something for you. The vast majority of scholars had no access to Greek manuscripts at all. Like I said, Erasmus had to, had to move to Basel, Switzerland, and he thought he'd find plenty of manuscripts there. He didn't. And they had one of the largest libraries around. So you can go online right now, and you can find all the manuscripts of the New Testament and what, what museum they're in and what they contain and when they were written. And thanks to the work of CSNTM, the Center for the Study of New Testament Manuscripts, they're digitizing all these manuscripts, and you can go online and see many of them today. You just don't have any idea how absolutely outrageously wild that is as far as history is concerned. How many of you are old enough to have used a card catalog? Oh, don't make me raise my hand. That hurts my arthritis. There were no card catalogs only a short period of time ago. Remember interlibrary loan? Libraries wouldn't loan books to other libraries. They couldn't. That nobody knew what was in anybody else's library. The idea of being even able to know where manuscripts were and what they contained, let alone compare them with one another. That's modern, modern, modern. In Erasmus's day, nobody knew. And the vast majority of scholars had no access to Greek manuscripts to be able to uh, check this stuff out, even if they could read Greek. And so what Erasmus did is when he did his second edition of his Greek New Testament, he said to the printer, look, uh, within a couple years of when he put his first edition out, the Align brothers um, put out their edition of the Greek New Testament. So he said to his printer, go get one of theirs, and replace the book of Revelation from theirs with what's in mine. Because he knew that his work on Revelation was bad. So go get theirs and just copy theirs into mine and we're good. One problem. The Align brothers had used Erasmus for their book of Revelation. <laughs> And hence, for hundreds of years, in the Textus Receptus, in the King James Version of the Bible, now in the New King James Version of the Bible, there are words and readings of words that had never been seen in the history of the church until Erasmus in a rush translated from Latin into Greek. But they're still there. And that's why. And that's why. Now, what that also illustrates is how different today is than only 50 years ago. The amount of information available to anyone who wants to look up what manuscripts are being used, what they contain, to compare them with one another, has never been seen in the history of humanity the way that it is available today. Now, why do I sound excited about that? Do you think it's just a, a coincidence that the very time when the greatest attacks are being launched against the veracity of the text of Scripture, we have far greater information and far earlier information about the text of the New Testament than we have ever possessed in the history of the church? You need to realize, like I said, Erasmus relied primarily upon manuscripts from the 12th and 13th centuries. We now have papyri that go back to 
almost the first century. We can reproduce the text of the New Testament from the third century. And if you've not, com if you've not looked at, you know, for example, Homer and, and other works from that time period, you need to realize the New Testament manuscript tradition is far. Is this uh, my problem here? Am I popping and cracking? And All right, okay. Hit the pulpit, Mike. That means I can't walk anymore. <laughs> all right, there goes all the energy. Yeah, so Greek. Um, yeah. Um. It's not nearly as wide as MacArthur's. I'm going to tell you something. I think. <laughs> But Brother Lawson will tell you there is one weird thing about that pulpit. You lean into it and it moves. <laughs> you know why it moves, don't you? It's on hydraulics. They just, just and it goes down there and it's like, oh, cool, all right. So first time I stood behind that thing and leaned in, I'm like, whoa, Nelly. <laughs> I don't want to be, would that make a YouTube meme or what? <laughs> the man that destroyed MacArthur's pulpit. Yeah, it's, it's I'm not going to do that. What were we talking about? Moses was in the bulrushes, and uh, what was going on there? Okay, we, you, you need to understand, we, our manuscripts now go back so much closer. When you look at those other ancient works, on average, their first copies are between five and 900 years after the original was written. I'll show you manuscripts tomorrow. I'll show you one manuscript tomorrow that was written within 100 years of when the Gospel of John was written. There is no other work of antiquity that even comes close to what we have with the New Testament. Erasmus had none of that. None of that at all. That's very, very important. So what happens is Erasmus puts out five editions. And like I said, Revelation, eh, not so... Not so good, uh, but that's just sort of how it ends up working out. A certain Augustinian monk in Wittenberg, Germany, gets one of those first editions. And he's sitting there reading. And on the one side, you have the Greek. On the other side, you have the Latin. And that's where he reads in the Latin, Ponitentium agate, do penance. Looks over at the Greek. Metanoiate, repent. It's not the same thing. Repentance is not doing penance. And that was very important in the light beginning to dawn in that Augustinian monk's mind, that Augustinian monk who is professor of theology at the University of Wittenberg. And you know I'm speaking of Martin Luther. And so, as I said, Five editions come out before Erasmus dies in 1535. And they are widely distributed. Widely distributed. And it's interesting that the farther you go in his editions, the more his attention is now focused upon the Greek rather than upon the Latin. And one of the most important controversies was in the first two editions of his uh, Greek New Testament, he did not have what is called the comma Johannium. The comma Johannium. I should not be using Latin at 3.09 p.m. in the afternoon. That is a very good way of making everyone fall asleep. But the comma Johannium is 1 John 5, 7 in the King James Version of the Bible. There are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit, and these three are one. The first two editions of his Greek New Testament did not contain that, because he had never seen a Greek manuscript that did contain those words. And in point of fact, we know today that there are no Greek manuscripts that contain 1 John 5, 7 in the King James Version of the Bible before the 14th century. And we have a lot of early manuscripts of 1 John, so that's a bit of a problem. Anyway, what happens is he is attacked because it's in the Latin Vulgate, but it's not in his Greek text. So he must be denying the Trinity. 
says, no, I've just never seen a manuscript that contained it. There is a manuscript, Codex Monfortianus, in Trinity College, Dublin. I've examined it in the reading room there in Dublin, Ireland. It's available online now. It came out about three months after I did that. <laughs> sort of made it. It's like, oh, thanks. Wonderful. Um, now everybody can read it. Um, and it was written in 1520. Most of the time, we don't know when a manuscript was written. It doesn't come with a date on it. You know, it's not a time stamp. But this was written in 1520, and it was written specifically to refute Erasmus. And it has the comma Johannium in it, but not in the form it's found in what's called the Texas Receptus today, but in a different form, but it's there. And so under protest, Erasmus included it in his third edition and those that followed, and that's why it's in your King James Version of the Bible. Not because it's in any ancient manuscript of the New Testament, but because of what was going on with Erasmus. Those manuscripts, I'm sorry, those printed editions are vitally important for the Reformation and its work. Translation into other languages, vitally important. Then, in the middle of the 16th century, you have Calvin in Geneva. And Calvin's printer is a man by the name, his name is Robert Estienne, but his Latinized name is Stephanus. And Stephanus is a master printer. He's Calvin's printer. He prints Calvin's books. Calvin wrote a lot of books. And so he puts together a Greek New Testament in 1550. And that's what I hold in my hand. If you want to look at it afterwards, you walk by, you will see that the Greek font's beautiful, very regular, very ornate. And it was designed by a man by the name, and you're all going to know this name, of Garamond, G-A-R-A-M-O-N-D. How many of you have a Garamond font on your computer? Yeah, almost everybody does. Named after the man who made this, this font. As I said, 1550, no verse divisions. 1551, the verse divisions now appear in Stephanus' edition of the Greek New Testament. Then, about 40 years later, Calvin's successor, at Geneva, a man by the name of Theodore Beza, also has deep interest in the Greek New Testament, and he produces in 1598 a widely distributed Greek New Testament. And he has access to all of, of, of course, uh, Erasmus's work. He has access to Stephanus. And so now he produces a text, Beza's text, and it's Erasmus, Stephanus and Beza, those are the Greek texts utilized by the translators of what's called the Authorized Version or the King James Version of the Bible that was translated between 1604 and 1611. They aren't looking at new manuscripts. They're not trying to dig up older manuscripts or anything like that. They are translating only from printed editions of the Greek New Testament and, of course, making reference to the Latin as well, because they're all scholars of Latin. And so these are, your, these are the sources for the translation of the King James Version of the Bible. Now, they have differences. Erasmus made changes, not a lot, but he made changes between all of his editions. And then Stephanus has some differences and then Beza has differences. And in fact, Beza even made what's called a conjectural emendation. In Revelation 16, 5, all Greek manuscripts that we've ever found say the same thing. Who is and who was the Holy One. Hasios is the Greek term, Holy One. Well, Beza looked at that. And what do you see a lot of in the book of Revelation? Who is and was and is to come. The future form of the verb to be in Greek is esamenos. And Beza felt that esamenos was similar enough in form to hasios that he made a conjectural emanation. He did not have manuscript evidence. As some people say there's some, some place where he mentions some manuscript, but we certainly don't have any reference to anything at all. Um, no manuscript that we have in our possession today says anything other than Hasios. 
but he put esomenos in his text. And the King James translators generally relied on Beza more than Stephanus or Erasmus when there were differences. So this, Stephanus, this 1550, you go to Revelation 16.5, it says Hasias. But Beza, and all of, all of Erasmus says Hasias. But Beza put Esomenos, and that is what is in this, what's called the Textus Receptus. Okay? But no Christian until Theodore Beza had ever read Revelation 16.5 that way. I hope that means something to you. I hope it's important to you. Because it seems sometimes people in the modern age, they look back upon the ancient church as just a bunch of rubes and aren't concerned about what texts they had or how they understood things. But I think it's important that we should be reading pretty much the same text they're reading at the Council of Nicaea, maybe. Council of Chalcedon, possibly. When you're dealing with key issues regarding the deity of Christ and the relationship of the divine and human in Christ. And be good to have a good text you're, you're, you're reading from there. It's important. Now what happens is after the publication of the King James Version of the Bible, and that was not the first English translation, obviously. Uh, you had Bishop's Bible and you had Tyndale and, and, uh, and of course the Geneva Bible, the favorite of the, of the, of the pilgrims and uh, many of the Puritans and things like that. But the Greek text that, was, that came out of that period becomes standardized. In 1633, the Elsevier brothers put out a, a Greek New Testament. And back then, your advertisements were in Latin. Um, so scholars could read them. And, but then again, everybody learned Latin if you went to university or anything like that. Good grief, in the 1600s, to get your advanced degree in England, you had to be able to debate in Greek. Not read Greek, debate in Greek. And almost nobody today can do that. Tells you a little something about educational systems. But the Elzebra brothers put out a, a standardized edition, and in the advertisement for it, they called it the received, the text that has been received by all. Textus receptus in Latin the received text. Now, today, in many places, this is a publication of the Trinitarian Bible Society. Oops, microphone, I forgot. <laughs> this is a publication of the Trinitarian Bible Society. And most people call this the Textus Receptus today. Okay. But it's not. This is actually the work of Dr. Scrivener. And at the end of the 19th century, Dr. Scrivener got a bright idea, mainly because he wasn't sitting around watching TikTok videos. <laughs> I'm not sure anyone has ever gotten a bright idea uh, from watching TikTok videos, but gotten a lot of dumb ideas from watching TikTok videos. And so he asked himself the question, we have Stephanus, we have Erasmus, we have Beza. What decisions did the King James translators make as to the differences between them? And so he took those Greek texts, he went to the King James Bible, and in the vast majority of instances, they're all saying the same thing. And so there weren't, there, you know, it was pretty easy to figure out what the text was. But where there were differences, he looked to the King James as to what decision they made. And he created this text based upon the textual decisions of the King James translators. So the irony is, this is a Greek text based upon an English translation. It's a Greek text based upon the choices made in creating an English translation. And yet there are many today who are brothers and sisters in Christ, but there are many today who are promoting the idea that what we need to do today is go back to this. Now, this was based, even if you include any of the references Stephanus had, Beza had, 
This was based on less than maybe two dozen manuscripts. Some of you have seen this. Um, this is the Nessie Allen 28th edition that Jeffrey Rice bound for me, which when I showed it on the dividing line, Jeffrey Rice is now a very busy man. <laughs> He's months behind in fulfilling orders, as he should be, because they're all hand done. But when he did this one for me, uh, I showed it on the dividing line, and it's like, wow, that's gorgeous. And it is. This is the 20th edition of the Allen text. And it is based on, ref, makes reference to approximately 5,600 portions of the Greek New Testament. Now remember, the older a manuscript, as we'll see tomorrow, the less likely it is that it contains all the New Testament. Having all the New Testament in one place was a major development. All the New Testament books circulated as singular books initially. Each of the Gospels, Paul's letters to the churches, so on and so forth, that eventually became collected, collected, collected until you have the New Testament. But we have over 5,600 either full portions, full New Testaments, or portions of the New Testament. In Greek, we have thousands of Latin manuscripts. We have Coptic, Boharic, Sahidic. Altogether, we have well over 25,000 handwritten manuscripts in various languages of the New Testament going back to various times in history, many going back to very early periods in the history of the New Testament. Now, if you're going to make this the standard, then everything that's been discovered, cataloged, and analyzed since then that does not agree 100% with this is irrelevant. The papyri, for example, that we're going to look at tomorrow, P52, P72, P45, P46, that take us back to around the year 200, P52 to around the year 125, irrelevant. Completely irrelevant. If you make this the standard. And there are those that are promoting that. Now next Saturday evening in Loisville, Pennsylvania. Chris is going, yes, Loisville. Good. Uh, I'm going to be doing a debate uh, with uh, Dr. Peter Van Cleek Jr. Uh, who is promoting this kind of a movement and the supremacy of the Texas Receptus and of the King James Version over all the rest of what we have. And you might say, why in the world would you, there's so much going on, the world could grief, we're all gonna end up in the gulags pretty soon anyways. <laughs> you laugh, but some of you aren't laughing because yeah, that's more of a <laughs> possibility than it's ever been before. Um, and why, why do something like that? Because Chris had to do something, and so that's what he came up with. No. Um, the reason is, I think this is a very, very important issue. Because as I said before, it seems to me that right at the time when the Bart Ehrmans of the world are convincing people that we have no idea what the New Testament originally said, we actually have the greatest ability to respond to that attack upon our text than we've ever had before, unless you do this. Unless you say, nope, we just need to go back to the, the 17th century, and that's good enough. And we're not going to worry about how it came together. We're not going to worry about how Erasmus made his decisions, because he had to make textual decisions, because the manuscripts he had differed from one another. We're not going to worry about any of that. God blessed this because this is where the King James came from and the King James has been blessed for 400 years, verily and forsooth. <laughs> well, you know what? God did bless the King James version of the Bible. I grew up on it. A lot of my memory verses still come out with these and thous. I've got nothing against the King James version of the Bible. The only problem is I read what the translators of the King James version of the Bible said about the King James version of the Bible. And they didn't believe it was going to be the last word of all things. They never had that idea. They didn't think they were giving the final word at all. And so I am concerned that the next generation, the generation after that, generation after that, have a solid foundation. Did any of you catch um, 
oh man, I think it was 2016, 2017. Uh, when I was on the Dr. Drew show, you were in the audience. Wow. Hey, this is, this is mobile. <laughs> I picked that up and sort of freaked out. Um, so. um, I was asked, initially I was on by Skype. Bad move, bad, bad move. You cannot do a debate via Skype with people who are live in a studio. It ain't, no, they could walk over you, talk over you, no. So we did one segment where I was, I was on uh, Skype and then they called back and they said they wanted me to come back on. And I said, well, I'll only do that if I can, if I can come in studio. Well, we can't afford to fly over. My wife works the airline, I can fly over. Well, we can't afford to put you up, we'll put me up. Well, if you can get here, then sure, you can be live in the studio. So I flew over to Los Angeles, walked through the gates of hell into CNN, and <laughs> you, you could just feel the demons and uh, it was really wild. And um, so I was in studio. And in fact, I was in studio with the transgender guy who a few weeks later threatened to beat up Ben Shapiro. Okay, remember that guy? He's a former army helicopter pilot, hands this big. And who, who sat there and threatened to beat up Ben Shapiro in a very feminine fashion, no. Um, anyway, in the course of that back and forth on the, on the program, I quoted Jesus' words from Matthew chapter 19. From the beginning, God made them male and female. And I remember saying to one particular individual, when you can predict your own death, burial, and resurrection, and then rise from the dead, then we'll take your word seriously. Till then, we take this guy's word seriously. He's got the authority to find this stuff. But, and we all say, yay. Here's the question. What happens when the skeptic responds to you by saying, but are we sure Jesus actually said that? Or is that just simply something from, oh, say, the 17th century? We need to be able to demonstrate that the New Testament goes back to the sources that it claims to go back to. It's vitally important. That's why I think this is an extremely important subject. I'm, right, right as I left, most of you know that I drove here from Phoenix, Arizona. <laughs> I, um, I did not have to stand in any lines for my flights to be rescheduled or anything like that because the only lines I was in was at the gas station uh, to fill up my truck pulling my RV. That's how I get around these days. Okay, we can talk about why at some other point. But I drove all the way here. Uh, and in that process, listened to, you know, all the argumentation that I'm going to be dealing with in the debate uh, coming up uh, next week. And I truly believe that for all of us, you know, I, when I left, I'm very thankful to the Lord. Uh, most of you know that my, some of you, some, okay, most, some of you know that my daughter Summer was expecting. She had had two miscarriages in a row, so we had been praying very hard for this little baby. And little Ransom was born at 11.38 the night before I was pulling out in the morning. And so I rerouted myself through the East Valley so that I could uh, hold him in my arms, uh, pray that God would draw him to himself, and then warn him that he has three older sisters and so he's doomed. <laughs> I was the first one to tell him, and so I'm just going to remind him of that. But, so I have five grandkids, and I'm going to tell you something. There are a few things that change you. The first thing that changes you when you get married, because that woman is not like you. That's what marriage is supposed to be. When you redefine marriage so you can marry a mirror image of yourself, that's not marriage. Never will be. Doesn't matter who says otherwise. Second thing that changes you is your kids. That little baby is the most concentrated source, black hole of selfishness ever created on God's earth. 
only cares about itself and nobody else. <laughs> am I making, am I giving mommy a migraine headache at 3 a.m.? Who cares? <laughs> Feed me, change my diaper. <laughs> Black hole of selfishness just sucks it right out of you. It's great, it's wonderful. Great act of, of, of sanctification. <laughs> and then I can see a few heads in here, either the white hair or no hair at all. You know, you become a grandparent. And all of a sudden, you realize, oh my goodness, I'm part of something a whole lot bigger than myself. There's an, my babies are having babies. And it may not be long before my babies' babies are having babies. And all of a sudden, you start getting a whole lot bigger picture than you've ever had in your life before. And that's what I'm looking at. I'm looking down the road. We may be going into a period of real darkness. I don't know, unless God works in a miraculous way. We're going into a real period of darkness. But you know what? Christ is still on his throne. Amen. And some generation down the road is going to need us to have been sowing into them the foundation of the truth upon which they can build the future. And so, that foundation is found in the living and abiding word of God. I believe in providential preservation. I believe God has preserved his word. How did he do it? Through the amazing New Testament manuscript tradition that even the Romans tried to wipe out and couldn't. So it's not a matter of who believes in providential preservation. It's how God did that providential preservation that is the issue. And so I say to all of us, there's some great work on this. There's some not so great work on it as well. Learn how you got your Bible. Teach your kids, teach your grandkids that they can trust the word of God because the, words, the world's gonna tell them just the opposite. Sow into them your faith in scripture. Give them that foundation. That is the most precious thing you will ever give them. You may be already planning on your Christmas presents. Well, make the greatest Christmas gift you ever give to your grandchildren, your children, a solid foundation for understanding where the word of God came from. So when the people of the world say, why should I believe what Jesus said? They will be able to answer that question. That is the greatest gift that you can give to them. Seriously. Now, this was just a breakout session. Yay. So I, I mentioned before, um, I will make the Stephanos text, and I'll go ahead and put my Jeffrey Rice, uh, you know, as long as your, your, your fingers are clean and stuff like that, you can take a look at Jeffrey's work, but I will have the Stephanos text out. I think what I'll probably do, given that there's a, like a music stand down here or something like that, a flat one, uh, I'll put that out and I'll, I'll open her up for you, and you can take a look at uh, what she looks like, um, as I said. 15.50 to now, it's a long time, so be kind to her. She's tired. <laughs> um, but we'll, take, well, we'll give you an opportunity of looking at the Stephanos text, and then tomorrow morning, uh, we will go more in depth. We'll be using the screens uh, to look at manuscripts and go into the earlier period, more talk about uh, the papyri and, uh, and things like that. And I hope you'll be here for that because I really do believe it's not only exciting, but very, very important as well. Thank you very, very much for your attention. God bless you.